foundation of what we believe about Jesus. As I said, it's not an exhaustive list. But with this foundation, hopefully you can continue to search other areas and find other things that are built upon this that strengthen your belief and faith in Jesus and strengthen your understanding about who he is and how the Bible has revealed him to us. So, ten things we got to go through. Let's get started with the first thing. And that is that we believe that Jesus is a part of the Trinity. Now, it might be a strange place to start, but as we move through the list, you'll kind of understand a little bit of how we're moving through this. And what this specifically is saying is that Jesus is a part of God. Kind of. He's a part of the Trinity. He's a person in the Trinity with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Now, what's, what's saying that in this is that Jesus is a piece or, or a, a part of God. And a great place that we find this defined, I guess, is in John chapter 1. So John starts off in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you might ask, well, how in the world is this saying anything about Jesus being a part of the Trinity? What This is talking about the Word and about God. It doesn't even mention Jesus here at all. Well, when we read this, we're defining Jesus as the Word. And you might say, okay, well, how can we possibly do that? Where's this connection that we can say Jesus and the Word are defined as the same thing? If we read on in John chapter 1, we get to to verse 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, we actually see John defining the Word as God's one and only Son, the Word as the flesh. The Word became flesh. Now, we define this flesh as Jesus. The flesh was Jesus coming to earth and walking amongst us. And so this Word, then, is defined as Jesus. Now, to further this, we find both God and Jesus claiming to be in relationship with one another. So after we've, we've made this initial discovery in John chapter 1, we also see God claim to be in relationship with Jesus. And he does this at his baptism. In Jesus' baptism from Matthew chapter 3, it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So here we see God defining Jesus as his Son. We see God defining this relationship with Jesus in Matthew. And if we continue to read through the Gospels, through the books, we find in John chapter 10, that Jesus, while he was preaching, made a connection of himself with God. In chapter 10, verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. Now this is a key piece, and this is a clear definition of of God the Father and God the Son being in relationship and being one. Now, the Trinity is made up of three parts, and the other one would be the Holy Spirit. But we're not worried necessarily about his involvement with the Trinity at this point. We're saying Jesus specifically is a part of the Trinity, and we're using these verses to define that. So when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he's recognizing himself as being a part of the Trinity. And that's the first thing that we believe about Jesus. Now, the second thing we believe about Jesus is that before he came to the earth, before he was made flesh, He was with God. Or another way to put this is that Jesus has always been. Now, this is actually an argued topic. Some people don't necessarily view Jesus this way, but in Reformed theology, this is how we view and understand Jesus. It means that Jesus was not created by God if that makes sense to you. Jesus wasn't a piece. There was the original God the Father, and he said, I need to be a trinity, so I'll create Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and then I'll have a trinity. That's not 
how this functioned. Jesus was, just as God was, just as the Holy Spirit was, always, from the beginning. And the way we define this is in John chapter 1, actually in verse 2. So John chapter 1, we see the word defined as Jesus. And in verse 2, it says, He was with God in the beginning. So he there is being defined as Jesus. So we see Jesus being with God in the beginning. Jesus always being with God. He was not a created piece of God. He is God just as much as God the Father. And we believed that about him. Now the third thing then we believe about Jesus is that his birth, when he came to earth, when he became flesh, was miraculously conceived between the Holy Spirit and Mary. And we talked about this a little bit back on December 26th. We talked about this and we read in Matthew chapter 1 where this is defined. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 it says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, and you know what that means, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. This point's relevant because there is actually arguments about when Jesus became God. Some people say, okay, Jesus was born an infant, and then actually when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended on him, that's when he became God. But we don't believe that. We believe that Jesus was fully God from his birth, from the flesh that was brought to the earth. He was already God. And we believe that because of the divine or miraculous conception that he went to, through. Being born of a virgin through the Holy Spirit defines Jesus as God's son, which is defined as God, even from his birth. He didn't change halfway through his life. He was always defined as, as God, and, and we believe that he was miraculously conceived in that way. Now, the fourth thing, I feel like I'm moving a little quick, but hopefully you guys are keeping up. The fourth thing that we believe about Jesus is that when he was on earth, he was both fully God and fully man. Now, the youth group guys are probably like, oh, great, this topic again. Because we, we've hit this one home pretty hard because it's quite a relevant biblical point, right? If Jesus was just a man or just God, a lot of the things we understand in Scripture don't work out anymore. But we believe that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. Now, there's a lot of controversy, again, about, about this topic. And the reason I think this one is so controversial is because the whole book of the Bible, or the whole Bible, kind of falls apart if this argument isn't true. And so we see people or, or the devil working in arguments to create doubt about, well, who Jesus was. Maybe he was just a good guy. Maybe he was just a prophet. Maybe he was a spirit or a ghost. Maybe he was not actually who he claimed to be. But we don't believe that. That's not what we believe. We believe that he was both fully God and fully man. The first piece of scripture that I want to use to define that comes out of Philippians chapter 2. It says in verse 5, in your relationship with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So we see both things defined here. We see him, him being in the very nature God and being in human likeness and found in appearance as a man. And you might argue, okay, well, in the very nature God isn't God, is it? It's the nature God, not actually. He doesn't say that he was God or being found in appearance as a man. We make robots that look like people, but they're not people, right? So maybe you can argue, well, this doesn't necessarily cover this. But if we continue on in, in the Bible and continue to look around, we see in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. 
sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now this is the same Son of God as we talked about in the earlier points. This is Jesus. And here it says he's the exact representation of his being. Jesus is fully God. He's the exact representation of him. There's there's no difference between the two. And we can also use verses from our argument of the Trinity where Jesus says, me and the Father are one. He's defining himself as fully God. So then you might give on the front of him being God, but what about him being a man? How can we actually prove that out? How can we define that? Well, as Hebrews, again, actually does a great job specifically talking about this. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. I want to use that as, as my core piece of why we believe that Jesus was fully man. When God is confronted with things, he is not tempted. There's nothing that's going to come before him to convince him to do something that he does not want to do. But man doesn't necessarily have that luxury. He, when we are tempted, we, we struggle. We sometimes fall. But Jesus, when he was tempted, when he was in situations just as we are, when he was in his weakness as a man, he did not sin. He walked on this earth perfectly so that his life could be laid down as a sacrifice. And that's why we believe that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. So then we move to the fifth thing. The fifth thing we believed about Jesus is that he actually lived a perfect life. Now Hebrews 4 just kind of defined that for us, but I want to pull a different verse just to say that's not the only one that we have that states that. It's actually stated multiple times through the Bible, but out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we find God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God made him who had no sin. This is Jesus. Jesus came and had no sin. He was the perfect spotless lamb who who ultimately sacrificed himself for us. And he had to be. You see, the Old Testament, it points out a need for a sacrifice and ultimately a perfect sacrifice. One without blemish, one without stain, one with nothing wrong with it. If it wasn't perfect, it wasn't an acceptable sacrifice. So when Jesus came, he had to be a perfect sacrifice. If we're to believe that Jesus died for our sins and that that sacrifice was accepted... It had to be perfect, and that's why we believe that Jesus lived a perfect life. Now, the sixth thing, then, that we believe is that Jesus died on the cross with the purpose of being a perfect sacrifice. There's kind of two key points here. One, that he died, and the second, it was as a perfect sacrifice for us. So first, the dying. We read in John chapter 19, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We define this giving up his spirit as death. And later on, to confirm his death, we actually see a Roman soldier perform the common task of of stabbing him in the side. In John chapter 19, verse 33, it says, But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Jesus died on that cross as a perfect sacrifice for us. We already defined that he lived a perfect life, and now we're defining that he died as a perfect sacrifice for us. Now, You might be thinking, well, we're only on point six and Jesus already died, so how are we going to finish out the rest of these points because there's not much else to talk about after Jesus' death. And the seventh that we'll talk about is that after Jesus died, he resurrected from the dead. We define this in John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, that's Sunday, when the disciples were together, 
with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, what he showed them his hands and his side. He showed them the holes in his hand and the piercing in his side. He defined that, yes, I died on that cross, but now I've been resurrected. Now I've come back. And when Jesus walked on the earth, more than 500 eyewitnesses saw him confirming his resurrection. And this was to confirm the doubting problem man can have in regards to this part of the story. You see, Jesus coming and dying is kind of what all people do. They come to the earth and then they die, and that's the end of the story. Everybody has that, that path ahead of them. But Jesus' story is different. Jesus' resurrection changes the script. It, it brings to light something that none of us have the power to do. We can't resurrect ourselves, but Jesus, God, has power over death. And because of that, our belief that he resurrected Jesus from the dead gives us faith that he can do the same for us, that Jesus holds the keys to death itself and so that we can all be saved and resurrected as well. Now, the eighth thing we believe is that after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. In Acts 1, verse 9, we read, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. See, Jesus resurrected. He walked on this earth. He talked with his disciples. And after that, he was taken into heaven miraculously. Now, this was to fulfill an Old Testament, prophe- or Old Testament prophecy out of the book of Psalms. In Psalm 68, 18, it says, When you ascended on high, you took many captives. You received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, that you, Lord God, might dwell there. Jesus' ascension fulfilled the the end of Jesus' time from his flesh here on earth to his ascension to heaven until he comes again. Now the ninth thing we believe is that after his ascension, he is gone to be at the right hand of the Father and is interceding for believers. And we read about this this practice, this, this thing in the book of Hebrews among other places. Now, Hebrews does an incredible job defining the role of this high priest, defining the role of this intercession. In our Bible study downstairs Sunday mornings, we've been going through this practice of Jesus as the high priest. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23, it says, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So here we see him defined as interceding. Now, for those of you who don't know, interceding is praying. Interceding is talking to God on our behalf. So when we come, we pray in the name of Jesus We're presenting this to him who's presenting this to God on our behalf. That is intercession. That is the role of the high priest. And that's what we see as the role of Jesus. But here it doesn't say anything about him being at the right hand of the father. Where did that come from? Well, in Romans chapter eight, it says, when this or who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, there again we see the resurrection, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, the right hand of God is actually an interesting one because there's, there's nearly a hundred verses that define Jesus as being at the right hand of the Father. This is just the one that I picked because it, it had the intercession right after it. And it again reinforces that Jesus and the Father are one. Now that was number nine. We've we've made it to number ten. Kaylee's like, all right, I can check them all off my list. Things are going well. And so the tenth thing 
that we believe about Jesus, and this is the, the piece I would like to close with, is that Jesus is the only way to God. And a common verse that we derive this from is, is John 14, 6. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and he answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, in regards to Christianity, what we read in the Bible shows only one way to be in right relationship with God. And, and that one way is perfection. That one way is holiness. It's, it's taking the law that we read about in the Old Testament and living perfectly according to it, never sinning, never falling short, never missing the mark, never taking ourselves out of perfect relationship with God. That is the only way to be in relationship with him. And the sad news for all of us is that we miss that boat. We sin. We, we lost that relationship. You see, when Adam and Eve fell, mankind lost the perfect relationship that they had with God. But through God's great mercy and grace, he made a way for us. He promised through the Old Testament that a Messiah was coming. He promised that he will send a rescuer. He will send one who will save you. And that the one coming will make a way for all of us to be in right relationship with God. Now Jesus was that Messiah. That's what we believe. He was the way, the truth, and the life. He has made a way for us to come before the throne of God. He has made us in perfect relationship because of his fully God, fully man, perfect death, resurrection, and ascension. That is why we declare all of these things that we believe, because without it, any way could get you to heaven. Any way could, could get you to God, but that's not the God we read about in the Bible. That's not what Jesus defines for us. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And because God made this way for us to get to him, that's why we worship God. It's because he's made this way for us to be in right, right relationship with him. He's made this way for us to join him in heaven forever. Ultimately, we worship God because he made us, and then he made a way for us to join him in glory in heaven forever. Worship team, would you like to come forward? Thank you, Jubal, for those fresh insights. Um, we know the story of Jesus is true because uh, he's too awesome of a figure. Nobody could make him up. So he, we know he's true. Uh, let's stand and sing together one last song. shall be our home through days of preparation thy grace has made us full and now O King eternal we lift our glad of song we are O King eternal till sin's fierce war shall cease and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords of passion, nor roll of curling dogs, but deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom come. Lead on, O 
So as we go this week, think about these 10 things and think about other things that, that we believe about Jesus. Or maybe you disagreed with one of those 10 things. Look into it. See for yourself what the Bible says. Examine these things and, and define for yourself what it is that we see that God has revealed to us through Scripture and, and build your faith on what we see God revealing to us. Go in peace.